passionate, very powerful, and uh, in many ways a very insightful presentation. Um, my only um, uh, comment uh, right now is that um, his, his uh, statement that the non-Malays did not benefit at all from the uh, economic pie after independence is not correct. Institutional racism is all that more difficult to address in Malaysia to eradicate because the economic fruits were also taken up by the non-Malay elite who were co-opted, who colluded, and who collaborated in this system that was set up. And in fact, a large share of the economic pie and benefits went to these cronies and collaborators including in the MIC and in the Indian community and among Indian professionals. Ananda so, Krishnan. Know, let's, let's not forget about that. Huh? Second but, richest man in Malaysia. Yeah. But uh, as I said, you know, generally the trust of that uh, presentation uh, is, is, is extremely uh, powerful and to my mind uh, very valid. I'm going to pass you on to the next uh, speaker without delay. Uh, this is Dr. Kwa Kiasu. Thank you, Dr. Lim, distinguished uh, speakers, uh, Dr. Asmi and uh, Anissa. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, uh, I'm very happy to be here. I'm very happy to be sharing the same panel as uh, Indra, uh, which I think has been the most uh, progressive in this whole movement uh, <coughs> against institutional racism. I hope that this is the beginning of a, a continuing movement based on solidarity because sometimes I find that uh, when, I, when I surf the web, I'm also being attacked by Rajendra. Uh, so I, I hope, uh, you know, this is the beginning of a, 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 a love affair. But I'll try and put a different spin on uh, what Gavisan has said. Because honestly, this We've been, this country has been going for 54 years, as you know. And uh, the Arunoku Trust has been get, going, getting away with murder for so long. I remember when I was a 20-year-old, 20 20-odd-year-old 20 student, uh, my PhD thesis was on class and communalism in Malaysia. My first book was on class and communalism in Malaysia, published by Z Press. And my thesis in this book is no different from what it is today. It's the same today, but things are getting worse. Along the line, different minorities have picked up different momentum. Today, it is hate drug. I remember in the mid-80s, the Chinese company hall here, and with the rest of the Chinese associ associations, were also very active in the Civil Rights Committee in the 80s. So this is how history has moved. But let's, let's review it a bit. Uh, for a working definition, institutional racism is what Stephen Anden, who is the director of the Institute of Race Relations in, in, in the United Kingdom and the publisher of the well-known journal called Race and Class. He says, institutional racism is that which covertly or overtly resides in the policies, procedures, operations, and culture of public or private institutions, reinforcing individual prejudices and being enforced by them in turn. And we see that in almost all the institutions uh, in, uh, in, in Malaysia. Uh, Ghanizan has already talked about how the British are responsible, and in my, in my recent books on uh, patriots and pretenders, uh, I try to show how the British colonial power reneged on their promises after the post after the, the Second World War. Because after the Second World War, it was a time when civil liberties was a cry all over the world. And so the Malay Union, although it did not give South Rule to Malay at the time, did promise civil liberties civil equality, okay, but because 
The British also rocked up the fairness of the Malay rulers at the time. They revolted against the Malay Union. But so did also the rest of the Malay people, united under the Pan Malay Council of Joint Action and Putra, made of the Malay National Party and, 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 and etc. And so, after the revolt by the Malay rulers, as Afghanistan said earlier on about the Malay aristocracy, the British reneged on their promises, negotiated with the Malay rulers and Amno behind the backs of everybody else in Malaya. And that's how it came up with the Federation of Malaya Proposals in 1948, in which the requirements for citizenship, etc., were very, very stringent, ridiculously stringent for the time of the world. And so what we have at independence was Article 153. Article 153, as you know, was a clause allowing affirmative action, but it was, it was a clause that was borrowed from the Indian Constitution, where affirmative action was for the Harijans, who were a less privileged minority in India. In this country, the Malays were certainly not a minority. They were a majority, as well as the community that was holding the political power in this country, that dominated civil service. Okay, this is the difference, difference between affirmative action in the federal constitution of Malaya and the affirmative action in India. And so, with the British colonial power reneging on their promises, they came up, the, the recommission in the end came up with a kind of sunset clause. I think it was 15 years at the time. But when people, uh, when Malayans were independent, they expected that that sunset clause would at least, at the very longest, uh, you know, be 15 years, or well, at the most 1990. I think when the new economic policy was, uh, was uh, uh, implemented in 1971, people expected the new economic policy to end in 1990, which it hasn't. And I want people to just scrutinize Article 153. It's the number two clause of Article 153 says, to ensure the reservation for Malays and natives of any other states of Sabah and Sarawak, and that only came in in 1971, Sabah and Sarawak, you know, that, 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 that amendment, or such proportion as he may deem reasonable of positions in the public service and of scholarships, permits, licenses, etc. And as Ganesan has, has already mentioned, it excludes the Oranasi, who are the original people of this country. And the third clause in, in Article 153 is that the Yanni Patuan Agong may, in accordance with Clause 2, give such general directions to any commission. <coughs> the phraseology of, uh, of Article 153, and I'm sure our, our lawyer, Dr. Asmi, will give us some, some guidance on this. Uh, you will see that the way in which this affirmative action clause is phrased in Article 153 means that it has to be carried out with certain caution, with certain directions from the Yangi Patuan Agong before any kind of uh, affirmative action is carried out in any part of the Malaysian economy or, or institutions. But then, May 13 happened, as one my, 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 my book uh, said that to me it was an orchestrated uh, coup d'etat. But this thesis is not uh, I'm not the, uh, the author of this thesis. Earlier on, uh, there's uh, an academic from PASS called uh, Sufi Latif, who at an academic conference in, uh, in Singapore, in the Institute of Civilization Studies, had already come up with this thesis before me to say that in May 13, 1969, was a coup d'etat in the Tunku, which was, in my analysis, the emergent state capitalists in AMNO, in the state bureaucracy at the time, to overthrow the Malay aristocracy led by Tunku, because they were greedy for, for, uh, for having that, that, uh, that, capital, that state capital in the, in, the, in the economy, and that was one way to get rid of the Tunku. And uh, of course it worked. And after May 13, Malay centrism Bumiputraism became that central ideology. I mean, it's a very good ideology to use, a very good populist ideology to use. You know, telling the Malays this is your land against the Pandata, you know, and, and, and using that 
for them to uh, accumulate uh, more and more riches under the, the any NEP. And bear in mind that the 1971 amendment to one, Echo 153 happened during a state of emergency after May 13. So as you know, uh, the state of emergency only now, after how many years, uh, the government is talking about abrogating the state of emergency. But the 1971 amendment to the Article 153 was handled under the state of emergency. And that is the amendment that gave rise to the, to the, the so-called culture system that has made hell for all Malaysians up to now. That has allowed uninhibited discrimination. Okay? And again, if you look at 8A, you look at Amendment to 19, Article 1528A, where in any university, college, or other educational institution, the number of places is less than the number of candidates qualified for such places, it shall be lawful for the young people Tuan Agong to give such directions to the authority as may be required to ensure the reservation of such proportion of such places for Malays and natives of any of the states. Again, you see that there, that kind of affirmative action is, again, not uninhibited. If you find that in a faculty of law, for example, the MU, there is a need to have a bigger proportion for Malays, okay? That faculty can apply, to, can ask the Yagong to uh, allow such a quota for Malays. Well, reading that, I'm not sure if that any, any other lawyer or, or law professor uh, read that into that. But I, this was the interpretation of uh, the dean of the, the law faculty of Singapore, called Sina Durai, writing in the, the book called the, the, uh, the Constitution of Malaysia with, with, uh, with the Trinidad and Sufian. And this is his interpretation. That as far as he knows, this was not followed. This, at that time, was not even gazetted. And he has no idea whether what has been going on, what has been what has been carrying out with, with you know uh, without any inhibition has been done by the Ministry of Education or has been done with the direction of the Yanni Patrol Album. So this is something that I think anybody apply, for example, I, I, and any of your children, my children are big now, uh, apply to UITM for example, and if you feel to get in, Challenge it in the court. And if our judiciary is as independent as everybody is saying now to the sodomy uh, uh, case, then you have a good chance that you will win based on my reading of the, uh, the Article uh, 153 Amendment 8A. So uh, I won't go into great length with the racism and the racial discrimination that has been in existence ever since in even greater extreme after 1971, in the government it development policies, Canada, Petronas, etc., you know, uh, the business contracts, <clears throat> this counts. I was quite amazed recently when, uh, I think it was in the state of Selangor, they said that Bumi Putra's 